To this day, I can still hear Sweeney ordering us to put pillows over our faces. To this day, I can still see Wilbur shooting Alicia in the head. I can still hear the blast as he pulled the trigger. I can still feel and hear being shot back and in my leg. I can still feel the glass of the window cutting through my leg as I jumped through the window to save my life. I remember Alicia's blood, her brains, my blood, and the pain. I should have bled to death and would have if it wasn't for a good Samaritan. Our we are about to watch the parole hearing of a man who committed a brutal homicide. He is up for parole now because of Act 122. At the end of the hearing, we'll unpack it. All right, Mr. Sweeney, you're classified as a second felony offender. You're currently serving a 53-year sentence. You were sentenced in 1999, uh, August of 1999, St. Bernard Parish uh, for uh, armed robbery, <laughs> attempted first-degree murder, and manslaughter. In, in 2019, in Washington Parish, you have a conviction for contraband. Your parole eligibility date it was August 1st, 2021, and you have an adjusted good time day, which is February 2nd, 2040. Does that information sound correct to you, sir? Yeah. Right. Your case yeah. this morning has been assigned to Mr. Tillis. Would you answer any questions you may have, please? Good morning. How are you? How are you, sir? It's good. Uh, how long have you been incarcerated? I've been going on 27 years, sir. Seven years? I, I noticed. Go ahead. I was going on 27 years, sir. Okay. Um, I noticed you've gone through a lot of programs. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. What do you think about the programs you've gone through? They've helped, they've changed you, or you feel like you've been uh, Help by all of these programs because you have quite a few. Yes, sir. They have helped me out tremendously a lot. Where did you do time before you came there? Um, Were you currently, I was in Angola first, then I went to uh, Rayburn Correctional Center, then I came here. How long were you in Angola? Um, I think nine years. Nine years? So, mm -hmm. Uh, did you go through any training there? Yes, sir. I went through um, CPR class there, JC's class, um, living in balance, substance abuse classes, um, some Bible college classes, faith-based classes, um, NAA classes. Um, several, I did a lot of several, several classes at, um, at Angola. Were you familiar with Kairos Ministry? Yes, sir. I went to Kairos in uh, Rayburn. Oh, you did? <clears throat> yes, sir. I did Kairos in Rayburn when I was at Rayburn. What do you think about that program? It was a beautiful program. Uh, it teaches you more about love and respect. It teaches you about the compassion of others. And that's one of the, one of the best programs I actually took because the, the gratitude and, and the, the remorse and stuff that they showed us and how they were so compassionate for us, it, it really touched my heart. I see. I guess in your statement, you're going to probably tell us about some things, but uh, what you did was pretty bad, I thought. Yeah. I'm not here to judge you. Uh, but do you seem or do you think you've changed? Yes, I, I've changed. Yes, I've changed tremendously. Yeah. Uh, I know that what happened that night was real remorseful. I, I deal with that deal. I see. Thank you. No more questions. So, Mr. Sweeney, tell me about um, the most impactful program you took. Ma'am? The most impactful program that you took. All of them was impactful, ma'am. Um, because I, I learned a lot through each one, even the ones that, you know, someone was six weeks close, someone was ongoing. But each one of them helped build my character and helped me look at deep inside myself. Tell me about the 2017 contraband. Yes, ma'am. 
You were where? You were at uh, Rayburn? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Did you ever take any victim awareness classes? Yes, ma'am. I took um, I took one at Rayburn. I also took one at in Angola. And in fact, oh, I actually facilitated one in Rayburn. <laughs> all victims affect our world. And um, so in this, the, the uh, murder that occurred, you, you knew the victims? Yes, ma'am. Were they friends of yours? Yes, ma'am. And uh, we'll hear from them shortly. Um, there's obvious uh, opposition from, from uh, victims' family members as well as um, law enforcement. And, and what um, strikes me is that, well, I have a couple of things. First of all, you, you, lost, you have lost 417 days at good time. When's your, your last write-up? Um, last write-up was Christmas of 2022. And what was the offense? That was a uh, three-way phone call. And, uh, and then the last loss of good time was in February of 22. That was a 21, right? So when do you think you actually turned the corner? I mean, you, you think you, you say you've changed and you're doing well in your beauty. When, when do you think that change started happening? Well, the change started happening once I started taking those programs seriously. And I had a, a real quest of, of helping a lot of people once because I tried to give back because I felt remorseful, still feel remorseful for what I'd done. So a lot of programs, a lot of stuff I was doing to try to better myself to give to others. And in the process of that, helping others, I, I lost myself helping others. And I've seen that we hold up. I was doing too much to try to help without actually looking more into myself. So we, we had to re inventory myself. When did you learn your referral allergy? Um, that was when Act 122 came about. Right. So when did you learn that you were parole allergy? Well, I just got the people, I think that was two, about three months ago. So, so mm -hmm. between 2017 or 18, you, you didn't know that you were parole eligible? No, I wasn't parole eligible at that time. Okay. And and when you went to court, you you uh, agreed to your 50-year sentence through a plea deal. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. That's all the questions I have. Mr. Pryor, do you have any? Not right now. I might. Okay. Yeah, Sure. Warden, uh, is there anything you can add? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, from the swing and I talked pretty much in depth on, on yesterday. Um, pretty impressed about how you apply yourself with all the programs and so on and so forth and trying to help the offender population and other institutions you've been to. Um, the biggest thing I like to see happen with swing is uh, to recommend he have to get involved into the boys and men program. The boys and men program have several monthly topics. Uh, one of them in particular uh, speaks on recidivism. Uh, and I think that something be, be uh, to his benefit if he have to get involved in their boys and men program. All right, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> at this time, we'll hear from your the people, uh, Mr. Sweeney, who wants to speak in support. And first, we'd like to hear from your sister, the Reverend Swimming. I just wanted to say, I know uh, change is always uncertain, but on his journey to change, he did the work. And part of that work to show that he has changed is to take those classes and courses, but not only change physically, but it should be mentally and spiritually as well. And though he had obstacles in the way, as you pointed out, uh, that was a chance for him to examine himself and to realize that those things gonna happen and certain things will cause you to 
fall into the the, the traps and uh and uh and so I often reminded him you have to repent and ask for forgiveness. Um, and even for forgiveness, ask the family for forgiveness. Uh, uh, and I'm asking the board to consider uh, him for parole. And he has done the work and still is doing the work um, to that change. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for your remarks. We appreciate your you uh, taking the time to speak with us. And then we have Vladimir Celius. Um, I was like, I just like to talk about the relationship me and Mr. Wilbur Sweeney have. That I met Mr. Wilbur Sweeney back in like 2010 at Rayburn Correctional Center myself because I was formerly incarcerated and. We met doing, we was in the JC club and I was the president and he was the vice president of communication. And we just came together to see what we can do to better our community inside the prison. And what he stated when we started, we the ones started the program with all victims, all victims is our victim awareness program that we had started. And we were the co-founders of it. We facilitated, we went through it first, then we started facilitating the program. At that time, he became a tutor. I became a tutor in welding, and what we were doing as the student was graduating from getting a GED, we were bringing them on through welding. Wilbur Sweeney had been a, a, a big part of my life since I've been home through my transformation, because when I come home, I needed someone I could talk to to keep my head level heated. And he was one of them person that I can call, right? He'll call me, I'll, he'll write me on JP, and like right now, I'm a re case manager for Total Community Action in New Orleans. So if he is granted parole, he have a chance here. I could be his case manager, help him find a job, housing, and things of that nature. Anything that he needs for him to better himself once he do come home. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and uh, Miss Baldwin. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak on Will's behalf and. Um, I, I just have to say I'm I'm 82 and this is uh, reminds me of my mother had Alzheimer's and the only time she forgave me for a lot of my sins was when she couldn't remember anymore. But um, the thing that I have learned from Will is that he has been in a constant state of repentance and I know how hard it is to forgive when something has happened so tragically as has happened to the family of those uh, the person that was uh, killed. But I know that forgiveness is as much for the person who was wronged as it is for the person who did the perpetrating of the, of the wrong. And I, I want to say that um, I met Will in 2014 maybe um and i've written to everyone and you have that story mm -hmm. um and i it meant so much to me in these last years that will was a uh, part of my support system um i finally had a wonderful husband out of two that were alcoholics and ran away and then he passed away while after I had met Will and his wisdom and his comfort meant so much to me um, and to my family and to the little church that I belong to because I shared a lot of the things that he wrote and shared with me with them. And I know uh, in my heart, I know, but I know too intellectually that uh, Will has a place in the world on the outside to help people who are who are astray. He's a shepherd, and he will. He has not just that he will, but he has, in the past years that I've known him, reached out to others and tried to help them find their way because that's what he had to do. And he rightfully says he was helped 
and that's what he wants to do now. And he doesn't just say it, he does it. And I know that uh, when I was Will's age now, what the age that he is, um, I was still making mistakes as he has. And the thing I have, I have eight children and 14 grandchildren and five great grandchildren. And the thing I tell them all is please don't be afraid of your mistakes. As long as you use them to, to keep growing and becoming a better person. And that's what Will has done. And I'm proud of him for that. So I count him as one of my sons. Um, I've experienced everything with my eight children. Uh, some have been in jail and out of jail and in drug treatment and out of drug treatment. I've known it all. I've known all the heartache that the parents of the person who lost their their uh, child. Yeah, Miss Baldwin, I'm sorry to interrupt, ma'am, but could you wrap it up for us, please? We uh, yes, and 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 to wrap it up, I I just say I know it's a great responsibility that you have, and I feel that same responsibility, and um, and so in supporting him, I'm aware of that responsibility. So thank you for letting me speak for him. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, so we'll hear from uh, the victim's family. First, we'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Joseph Cacioppi. You want to speak? Mr. Joseph Jr., right? Yes. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> My name is Joseph Cacioppi. I'm the only surviving witness in the victim of a crime spree that resulted in cruel, premeditated, cold-blooded, execution-style murder of my fiance Alicia by Wilbur Sweeney. And my about-to-be-born daughter and cold-blooded attempt to murder me. I opposed granting parole to Wilbur Sweeney. At the time of her murder, Alicia was seven months pregnant with our daughter. Together, we were raising Alicia's three-year-old son and looking forward to the birth of our first child. We were a family until Wilbert Sweeney knocked on our door and destroyed it all. Wilbert Sweeney was supposed to be my friend. Instead, he plotted with his brother Johnny and Cornell Bush and did rob and kill Alicia in cold blood and attempted to kill me in cold blood as well. It's so cold blooded, gallows, and cruel is the manner in which they planned and carried out these crimes. It was calculated and premeditated. It took at least 30 minutes for them to drive from Kenner to my home in Chalmette. Sweeney had at least 30 minutes to think about what he was going to do to Alicia and me before arriving at our home. He could have turned around. He could have changed his mind, but he didn't. Alicia and I welcomed Sweeney into our home for at least 45 minutes. Sweeney pretended to be our friend, laughing, joking, watching TV, playing video games with me. Orbit looked at me and Alicia in the face. When Wilbert looked at Alicia, saw an obviously seven month pregnant woman, we meant nothing to him. During the entire time, we intended to be our friend. He knew that as part of the plan, Bush had a sawed off shotgun sitting just outside the door of our home. Wilbert and his brother Johnny had another gun that they hid until Wilbert pulled it out and pointed it at us at a prearranged time. When Bush retrieved the shotgun, he stood between us and the door to the outside while Wilbert and his brother searched our home for money and things to steal. Bush held me and Alicia at gunpoint, and Bush more than once threatened to kill us if we moved. When Sweeney returned from upstairs, he was carrying the pistol. To this day, I can still see the fear of Alicia's face. This day, I can still hear Alicia begging over and over, please don't kill me. To this day, I can still hear Sweeney ordering us to put pillows over our faces. To this day, I can still see Wilbur shooting Alicia in the head. I can still hear the blast as he pulled the trigger. I can still feel and hear being shot in the back and in my leg. I can still feel the glass of the window cutting through my leg as I jumped through the window to save my life. I remember Alicia's blood, her brains, my blood, and the pain. 
I should have bled to death and would have if it wasn't for a good Samaritan. I remember being told that one of the shots missed my heart and I was lucky to be alive. I shouldn't be alive. And if Wilbert Sweeney had his way, I'd be dead too. All three planned to rob and kill us. There was no way Wilbert or any of them were going to let us live. We knew them. I could identify them. I knew where Bush and Sweeney lived. I knew where Sweeney worked. I could describe the car they drove. If they if they live if we lived, they were going to prison. To prevent that, they had to kill us. Sweeney should serve every day he was sentenced to. Every day I live with the scars of that day, emotional and physical. Have not married and have not, have not fathered another child. Every day I think about what they took from me. The images of that day, Leisha laying in her own blood, the thoughts of our baby girl, our daughter, never getting a chance to live, and Alicia's three-year-old growing up without a mother. I get up in the morning thinking about it, and I go to bed thinking about it. To this day, I have never recovered from my physical injuries. I still have pain from where the bullet hit and damaged my sciatic nerve. I've had two surgeries and what will likely need more as scar tissue continues to accumulate and put pressure on my sciatic nerve. Every day I suffer with pain. I not sit more than a few hours. Foot and leg are always numb, causing the pain to increase. I will never be without pain. Wilbert Sweeney is not supposed to be eligible for parole. When Sweeney was sentenced to 50 years in jail, we were told that he would never be eligible for parole, that he would spend 47 years in jail, and that his jail time could only be reduced if he earned good time. And the judge made sure Sweeney knew this as well. Knowing that he would spend almost 50 years in jail helped, but even that small bit of comfort has been taken away when the Louisiana legislature recently gave parole eligibility to violent criminals, including Wilbert Sweeney. I feel that the state of Louisiana has betrayed me, that it cares more for life than it does for Alicia's life or my life, and the life of my daughter. The state of Louisiana has broken the promises it made to me, Alicia, our daughter, and our families. The state of Louisiana has put me on the burden of keeping him in jail as promised, no matter how traumatizing it is for me. It's on me to remind you of what happened. It's on me to relive and retell the awful events of that day. Wilbert Sweeney agreed to spend 50 years in prison without parole. <laughs> Wilbert Sweeney has already been given more leniency than he deserves, and parole for him is not justice for me, Alicia, our baby girl, who never had a chance to live, or anybody else who's involved. Yes, sir. Thank you. And Ms. Lombardino, it's my understanding that you'll be speaking on behalf of Mr. Joseph Sr. Is oh. that correct? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And we do have the letter that was written. So if you could just summarize your remarks in the interest of time, please. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. In the interest of time, if you would like to go to, to the other family, that will be fine okay. with us. Thank you. We appreciate it. All right, then we have, could we hear from Jeremiah, please? Good morning, how are you doing? Good morning, thanks for being here. What would you like to tell us? Um, my name is Jeremiah Avis. Um, Alicia was my mother. Um, I don't really have no memory of the shooting. I was present. Um, what I can say is Wilbur has made my life extremely hard. Um, I grew up with a lot of anger. Um, he took something away from me I could never get. I don't even know how my mother looked. Um, it's very painful. I have kids you can never meet. It's just hard. Um, <laughs> This is real hard. Um, if y'all have 
anything in y'all, any mercy, any power y'all can do, I beg you never to let him out. I would like to see him die in prison because what he did, my mother didn't deserve. So he, he doesn't deserve no freedom at all. If y'all could do anything, that, that's all I ask. Thank you, Mr. Avis. Thank you for speaking with us. And Ms. Bridget, is there something you'd like to say to us? Yes, ma'am. I don't want him out of there. Please, whatever y'all could do, keep him there. Please, this child, Jeremiah went through so much as a baby. <laughs> He don't know his mama. He didn't even get to meet his little sister. This child got a lot of anger management on everybody because somebody else took his mama. He won't know why he took his mama. I told him I can't do nothing. I can't explain this, why? I just ask y'all, please help us. This don't give him that freedom back, please. Thank you all. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you all. For, um, I know it took a lot of courage to speak with us this morning, and we do appreciate it. I'm going to ask Mr. Sweeney for, for his statement before we uh, let the DA close it out for us. So, Mr. Sweeney, is there anything you'd like to say to the panel and address your remarks to us, please? Y'all are on mute. She's coming to fix it. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, go ahead. Now go ahead. Yes, ma'am. This to, to everybody, um, first sub victims, I understand. Um, it was drugs, they had done it. It's never was the intent, but still the intent was bad because you know, I remorse, I lived through that daily myself. I beat myself up daily with that situation. I'm very remorseful and I understand each and every last one of y'all and I understand how y'all feel. Um, I just ask that please in some kind of way that y'all try to find forgiveness in your hearts. I understand the, the situation. I lost my brother. So I understand the, the, the ripple effect from that decision almost 27 years ago. My brother OD uh, last year. Uh, right here at Allen with me. So I I understand um y'all y'all remorse. I feel that remarks are to the committee. Your remarks should be addressed to us. Okay, I'm, okay, I'm remorseful. Um uh, I apologize and for my actions. It's nothing that I can say to change it. I live with that daily. My heart grieves. You know, I understand uh, with crimes, how the, the ripple effect, it only just affect that person, it affected many, 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 many other. Uh, I understand how widespread it did. And then I try to give back. I didn't took many courses to try to correct. You know, I know it's nothing I could do to, to see, to, to make it right or, or anything, but I just ask that, you know, God, just somebody just forgive me. I pray to him and I pray to God. And I know that, you know, that he has the last say though, but I appreciate the time and opportunity to be able to have this, this time. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um we'd like to ask Mr. Nikosha for um to close it out for us. Is he there with us? Y'all are y'all are in meeting. Yes. Okay, there we go. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Yes, I would like to just echo the thoughts of the victims, the courage it takes them to continually endure this pain. They have to attend this hearing. Uh, it was a gruesome event, a gruesome killing. And uh, we stand by the victims in asserting that the agreed upon sentence was 50 plus years. And we urge this board to uh, deny parole and stand by the deal stand by the sentence and uh thank you so much for the victims and we will always be here with you and we will always attend these hearings to make sure justice is done and uh, serve as handed down thank you
Sir, sure, thank you. You broke up a little bit at the end, but I think we got, I think we got, we definitely got your position. So thank you, sir, for uh, for joining us today. I think we are prepared to vote. Thank you. Voting first. Tonight. 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 Mr. Crater. Denied. All right. Uh, Mr. Sweeney, uh, you know, my vote is also to deny based on the opposition that's been expressed here this morning. I do appreciate the uh, your work, your community service that you've uh, trying to help others, but you got to work on yourself first. Uh, and you just you just seem like you just started that. So uh, my vote today is is to deny me parole. Uh, we wish you well. Good luck to you, sir. And I, uh, Mr. Nikosha, thank you for uh, your support at the Orleans event that we uh, we sponsored last year for victims. Thank you for being there. We appreciate it. That concludes our business. Warden Thompson is your facility today. We're going to sign off. It's 1134. Thanks for helping us out. Wow. That was the fastest denial that we have ever seen. It's We've never seen it. There's always a speech. This is like a new look. It starts with the preacher who, again, is the, I think, the only preacher that I have ever seen that does not like the sound of his own voice. I mean, he he had a horrible interview, if you even want to call it that. It was, he asked a few questions. He never asked about the crime. He never asked, but maybe he makes up for it in his just instant denial. And then he set the tone for the sheriff and Ms. Renatza. We've never seen that. It was quite fitting. You know, they were disgusted that he, I think, even applied for the parole hearing. Um, he really didn't deserve it in terms of what we have seen people do. You know, if he had started from day one, you know, doing all the programs and everything that he could do, he would have had a chance, but he had none. And like Ms. Renatza said, he just started, he was just starting that journey. Now, the, the, the first thing that really sticks out to me when watching this, and it's, it's uncanny how how it so consistently happens that the supporters come on to speak before you hear the victims and they talk about forgiveness and they talk about understanding and their head is in the sky and they're just like so disconnected from from the from the pain that is in the room with them virtually but from that pain it's like they're oblivious and i don't think you could have had a better example of that than jane i mean it, it was like first she she made it all about her she starts off i wrote a letter you can imagine talking about how i met him you can imagine that letter is probably 20 pages long and then she goes to talk about how our first two husbands died and then her third one and then he met him and he's such a great guy and he's so sp and talks about forgiveness and they're it's going and going and going we're waiting for the classic miss renata stop talking wrap it up i should say and you know miss renata cut her off right after she she said and i know what it feels like and it's just like, how dare you? You don't know what it feels like unless you know what it feels like. And she was referencing to some of her kids being in prison. What does that is not losing your daughter and future granddaughter. She was seven months pregnant. You know what it feels like? It's there's something wrong with these supporters. I you know I I understand the idea of supporting someone. 
but for some reason they come it's like birds of a feather flock together or the 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 idea of supporting a brutal murderer it attracts a certain type of callousness or narcissist or i don't know what the word is or what it is that causes that but we see it so consistently and then right as soon as she's done talking you hear then you hear real pain then you hear real suffering. You hear everything that that man has had to deal with from the moment it happened. And it's as if it was yesterday. And then you hear the mother and you hear the, and the pain is so raw. I mean, you just... Just think about what happened. They knew each other. They were friends. They're playing video games. Then he gets up and all of a sudden there's a shotgun and there's weapons and they're putting a pillow on their head. You're purposefully killing people. You don't deserve parole. I, I actually, I don't quite understand how they even gave him the light sentence that they did. And I guess... Maybe it's because they thought there's no chance by the time he gets out, you know, every, everyone, he's, it's too many years. He's, he's, he's straight sentence. There's no parole. And, and that's why they just took it. They didn't want to deal with the court. It was basically a life sentence. But who could have predicted with all these law changes? Act 122. And that was interesting I think Ms. Renatza did actually made a little bit of a mistake there because Act 1 to 2 was passed, I believe, in 2017. And it was then amended in 2021 to allow those who committed sex crimes and those who committed violent crimes to have parole because first Act 1 to 2 would not allow people of those nature to have parole. And so when Mr. Natsu said to him, oh, so so you didn't know that you were eligible? And he said, no, no, I'm not. I wasn't eligible yet. <laughs> and the moment he became eligible, he started taking programs. They hate that. This is the uh, act. So you can see here in, 19, in 2021, this is where they make the amendments. And you can see it scratched out. See, the provision in parallel shall not apply to any person who has been convicted um, of violence defined or sex as, but now it's uh, Word is struck through, type by deleting from existing laws, underscoring is additions. Um, when the offense was committed after August 1st, 2014. So as you can see here, I know it's a little bit confusing, but if it was committed before 2014, you would be allowed to. And then here where it had a clause, no, no person shall be eligible for parole considered who has been convicted of armed robbery and denied parole eligibility under the provisions. And then they slash that. So you can. Um, but, you know, that's the problem with Act 122. And it was interesting, too. We didn't see the parole project. And maybe that was a sign also that he had no chance. You know, maybe even the parole project wouldn't take him, uh, which is quite interesting signal. Maybe they just knew he had no chance. But they also had in there, I don't know if you caught it, but was it the preacher that brought it up um, or was it Ms. Renatza? But he had a 21 write-up and 21 is a sex write-up. And I wonder if his friend Jen, uh, Jane knows that. Um, she might be in for a surprise. And then what upset me too is, oh my gosh, of course, Ms. so certain things will never change. Ms. Renatza actually tells the victims for the sake of like time, can you move quickly? And the victim says, you know what? I'll pass over my, my statement. And it's like, Ms. Renatza, are you serious? You know, this is the first chance that these people are having the, the ability to speak and to share 
what they feel. Why do you have to take that from them? When I let's keep in mind, Mr. Nasser said, for the sake of time, this was the last hearing of the day. The hearing only went on about 15 minutes more since that, and that was it. Not only that, it wasn't the last hearing of a day that lasted, you know, like a, like some of these hearings can be an eight-hour, nine-hour day. It was a two-hour, 40-minute day. It was a short day. So Ms. Renata, the idea that she couldn't just give a little bit of time, it'll never cease to piss me off. He even had a new conviction in prison for contraband in 2019. We don't see that often. They didn't have details on that, but he actually got a, a new felony conviction in 2019, an actual felony conviction. Yeah, this guy had no chance. Uh, they, they just took the parole hearing because it was a legal requirement because of Act 122, but they knew that they were going to deny before the hearing even came. But, um, you know, something else that I noticed is again, we saw a district attorney, one that we've never seen before. Now it's possible we would have seen him anyways because of, you know, maybe for certain reasons, but it also, we might be seeing a trend because in the number of hearings that we've seen lately out of with this new parole board, it seems that district attorneys are, are showing up left and right names and faces we've never seen before. And I wonder if it has something to do with the new governor. Maybe it's a requirement. An so another new protocol is that the DA speaks last. It used to be that the defense attorney would always get to speak last, or at least the inmate. But no, now it's the DA. And it's interesting. It just is so interesting to see how when one new governor takes over, how things, how, how there are, you know, it's like you do get what you vote for. It, it, it feels, I, I know this might be silly just saying this because all oh, you know this already, but for me, it, it's it's kind of, a, it's a very tangible, of course, with other things, taxes and this and that, but it's, this is, it's so, it's, you, I so quickly see the change, right? He's, he, he, he got elected on saying he's going to be tough on crime and then to immediately see certain things that he put in place like the da speaking last like a new tough parole board um no it seems to be no nonsense uh parole board and the da showing up it's like wow this is interesting but that that was pretty that was a pretty quick change of course you have to see things play out but i i just wanted to share that um from what Richard shared, the there's a couple of old newspaper articles um, because again he took a plea deal, so we don't have an appeal, right? But I'll read from you from one if you want to go back. It says June 29th, 1998. Was oh, that when it happened? I thought I thought it was okay, maybe the um 1998, the two-year-old son of Alicia Avis of Covington slept unharmed in a second floor bedroom while his mother, who was seven months pregnant, was shot to death. The boy was taken into state custody after 1 a.m. Saturday shooting. Police said authorities believed a drug deal was behind the killing of Avis, 21, and her fetus. The woman's boyfriend was wounded in the shooting. Police have identified one of the suspects in Saturday's slaying and have issued a warrant for him on two murder counts. Um, may have been killed because the couple didn't cooperate with the three men, two of them armed who came to their apartment looking for something, according to the captain. They were found on her living room sofa, dead from gunshot wounds to the head. Um, Joe, who's 22, who's her boyfriend and father of the fetus, suffered a gunshot wound to the back and legs and, uh, and was cut when he jumped through the front window of the apartment, apparently to escape. The landscaper, who grew up in Kenner and lived in the apartment, 
less than six months, is listed in fair but stable condition at a hospital. Please decline, decline to name the hospital. And man, I didn't realize I must have missed that part. The two year old was sleeping upstairs. Wow. Did I, I feel like I missed things, like there's other things that I want to say, but thank you, Richard, for the info. And with that, I'll let you go.